happened. So um, I'm glad you guys came. And um, given that this is a family service, kids are here with us. I'm going to be a little more brief than normal. And the people said, amen. amen. That's right. I recognize some of you here tonight may be uh, checking us out for the first time, or maybe uh, you've just taken a, a, some time off from church for personal reasons. Maybe you're not particularly religious at all. Uh, and given the year that 2020 has been, you're here tonight because you really don't know what else to try. Uh, many times people try church on a Christmas Eve or an Easter service because they don't really know where else to turn. And so, candidly, I want to speak to you tonight. I know that sometimes we assume that the Christmas story of Jesus is known in pop culture, but I don't think it's wise to assume that. Uh, I, I don't think it's wise to assume that. I want us to read tonight the most prominent part of the Christmas story that's overlooked and maybe make some comments and encouragements that you'll find uh, important to your life. So if you have a Bible, you're welcome to look with me. I'll be in Luke chapter 2. We'll also have it on the screen behind me. The background context is this. Somewhere around 6 BC, not zero, yes, somewhere around 6 BC, the scene is in Israel. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she is engaged to a man named Joseph. They live in northern Israel in a place called Galilee, and they would eventually go south to Bethlehem to have baby Jesus. So if you will, read Luke 2.1 along with me. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, translated house of bread, just fun fact, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Betrothed is like engaged, just so you know. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and lied him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, of course, there are massive pieces of this story that are, you're kind of just already bringing in your mind to the understanding here. Uh, important things to know that we can see in Luke and Matthew's gospel. Um, we have heard in our readings, we've sung in our songs so far, this baby was long prophesied. So it's important that you know that. This baby was long prophesied. He was to fulfill the expectation of the Jewish Messiah. His mother, Mary, had never had, for the kids, relations with a man. This was a miraculous birth. This was a miracle of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was born in the prophesied city in the prophesied family line of David. Apparently not wealthy people because uh, when they went to Joseph's family, uh, there was no room, or they had overbooked the home, or something had happened. But anyway, the pregnant couple was outside uh, in the, the stable area where the animals were kept, and they laid baby Jesus in a feeding trough. That's what a manger is. They wrapped him in strips of cloth. That's what swaddling cloths are. And this was certainly a humble entrance into the world for the King of Heaven. Continue reading with me, Luke 2, 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And the angels went away from them into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart like a good mama. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard and had been told them. 
So we have this story. This group of shepherds approached by angels. Light explodes into the field. The shepherds are afraid, as you would be too. These weren't the hallmark precious angel babies. They weren't the little naked babies with the two-inch wings on their backs. All right, This is not those. These were fear-invoking angels. And they come down. They burst onto the field with lights. And they're told, don't fear. This is good news. That's nice to hear. The Messiah has been born. He is here. The sky lights up with more angels. Songs break out. Glory to God in the highest. Peace is coming. And so the shepherds go and they find baby Jesus, just as they were told. Then they glorify and praise God. Everyone's mind is blown. That was was Christmas. Everyone's mind was blown. So that's the facts of what happened. That's the information that happened. So it's a good question for us on Christmas Eve to ask ourselves, why was this such a huge deal? Why? Why the entourage of angels and singing? That didn't happen when my son was born. None of y'all showed up at the hospital with harps and sang anything. Just want to put that out there. Why the entourage of angels and singing and shouting in the night sky? Why the glory of God filling the air, the light show, the fireworks? Why? The answer is found in those words of Simeon that Patty read a moment ago. The prophet of God, when he held eight-day-old baby Jesus in his arms and looked upon him, said these words, My eyes have seen salvation, a light for revelation and for glory of God. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, the people who had walked in darkness had seen a great light. Now, what kind of darkness were the people walking in? How about the darkness of fear? We have certainly seen this year how fear can captivate and cripple us. When the darkness of the unknown future begins to creep in into our minds, can steal the present, that's where fear lives. How about the darkness of despair and discouragement. When you suffer a loss, maybe in your life you've suffered a loss this year, blow after blow after blow, loss after loss, you begin to believe that a win is impossible in your life. And in the moments of discouragement, you find yourself powering down and saying things like, well, what does it even matter trying anymore? How about the darkness of purposeless wandering in your life? When you feel like you've tried a little bit of everything, but you really don't know why you exist. You don't know what you're put on this earth to do. It can feel like being stuck in the darkness, not knowing where the light switch is. What about the darkness of not knowing how to have a relationship with God? What to believe, what is true. Not knowing how to please God, not knowing how to connect with God, not knowing what kind of life you're supposed to live and what is acceptable and what is pleasing and what is not, not knowing how to deal with sin in your life, not knowing what to do with a guilty conscience, not knowing what to do with shame over things that have already happened that you can't change. That is a darkness that we all experience in our lives. And so the world sits in this fog. Some try to find their own light, Some try religion. Some try the pursuit of happiness on their own terms. Some say there is no light to be found. Some have given up on trying to find the light. I would make the case to you tonight that the real joy and celebration of Christmas is that the light has already come into the world and broke through the darkness. Jesus grew up to be a man, and he spoke honestly about himself and his purpose on the earth. Listen to what he said in John 8, 12. Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. I have come to give you life, and if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. You can say amen on on an evening service. It's okay. That's the promise that Jesus makes to you. 
That's the promise that Jesus makes to me. So I'm asking you, are you following that light of Christ tonight? Are you? Are you walking in the light? Or are you stumbling in the darkness? And you should know, Jesus came to answer that question. And the question that we should not be asking at Christmas time is whether you've been naughty or nice this year. That's not the question of Christmas. When, when we say light and darkness, just so you know, when Christians say light and darkness, we don't mean making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. That's creepy anyway. Whoever wrote that, you're a weirdo, okay? So the question is, is your heart filled with hope this Christmas? Does your connection to Jesus make your outlook on life different than one who does not know Jesus? Is there a significant difference in your worship, in your heart, in your soul, in your mind? Because Jesus came on that first Christmas morning. Jesus is in the business of transferring people from dark into his marvelous light. That's what he does. He said, I am the light of the world. No, he did not say, I am one of many lights in the world. He said, I am the light of the world. So if it's a release from the darkness that you're seeking this Christmas, and I'll do one better, this new year, that answer is found in a life commitment of faith to Jesus Christ. Yes, he started as a baby, but he became so much more than that. This baby Jesus in the manger wrapped in swaddling clothes would grow up. He would become a great teacher with parables, lessons, still famous to this day. I love them and you love them. He would call 12 disciples that would follow him day and night. He would perform miracles like turning water into wine and healing a blind man and restoring his sight and feeding 5,000 people with baskets of food and walking on water and calming the raging sea with a voice, just one word, and it stops. He would challenge religious leaders of his day who exploited people through false religion, appearing pious on the surface but empty underneath. Jesus dismantled that. He spent time with those who were outcasts of society, giving his life and energy to those considered to be nobodies. Eventually, he would speak openly about himself in such a way that people would understand who he was. He said that he was the bread of life. He said that he was the Messiah. He said that he was the door to the sheepfold of God. He said that he was the living water. He said that he was the resurrection and the life. He said that he was the better bronze serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness. He said that he was the son of man and the ancient of days in the vision of Daniel. He said that he was the son of God and before Abraham was, I am. He said he was the son of David, a king with all authority over this world. He said he was the true vine, the connection to God, the only way, the truth, and the life. He said he was appointed to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to proclaim the Lord's favor. He said he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he would do that. As his own people heard all these claims, they gnashed their teeth at him and shouted, crucify him. Jesus was nailed to a cross as the light of the world absorbed all of the darkness you have experienced and will ever accrue in your lifetime. He absorbed it onto himself. And Jesus took all that darkness into the grave where he died for you. And on the third day, he resurrected to new life, and the light was brighter than ever in the resurrected body of Jesus. And he ascended to the Father in heaven where he is right now praying for you and reigning as the king of the universe. All this so that you who walk in darkness could experience the light of life. That you who are estranged from your heavenly Father can enter into a relationship with him and be forgiven of your sins and know your creator so that you can walk in the light each day, not caving to the ways of the world and sin, but enjoying fellowship with the light. 
Faith in Jesus and following him is what makes this life in the light even possible. There is, this is not a detour from the Christian message. This is the Christmas message. God loved us so much that he sent. Without Christmas, there's no scent. He sent his only son to come and save us. The light of heaven had to become the light of the world for us. Why do we often surround ourselves with these candles? Why do we put lights on Christmas trees? Now, I know you can find some other reason, but I know what we think of, Christians think of in our mind, to remind ourselves that the light of the world has come. Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us. He offers us grace upon grace. He makes the Father known to us. He calls those who believe children of God. And so why is it a merry Christmas? Because no matter what happened in 2020, and no matter what will happen in 2021, the light has already come into the world. Our King has come. And so we can say, oh, come let us adore Him. Pray with me.